Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And it is evening. It is just about 6 p.m. UK time now. I am joined this evening by the venerable Panama Hat. Good evening, sir. Uh, good evening. It's good to be back after our uh, hiatus. <laughs> yes. Uh, those, those heady days where we believed that we would be able to get back to this series within a mere <laughs> two weeks. Goodness gracious, how it all got a got it got out away from us. Uh, those of you who were here with us last time and who have taken note of the title of this stream uh, will know that this is a series that Mr. Hat and I are doing on a history of everyday things in England and the period yes. 1733 to 1851. It's what we call a cosy stream, what we coined last time. It's very cosy. And uh, the general idea is that we're going to do a read through. I will provide images from an archived version of the same book, which I have strangely enough sourced from the Indian culture website, uh, <laughs> because it's virtually impossible to find a copy uh, on the UK market. But uh, it's a series of, uh, this is actually a series of four books. Uh, covering different periods of uh, England all the way through to, uh, I believe, 1952. So, and this, this revised edition was published in 19, uh, 1952. So um, it's a, it, it covered about 900 years of, of English living. Um, as I said last time, the authors of this book come from a different era. Um, it's really interesting to observe uh, all of the little comments and expectations that were present. So, for mm -hmm. instance, this book is a book for children, and uh, the the idea is that they would. It's filled with information. I mean, we spent a good amount of time in the last stream discussing Jethro Tull's seed drill and methods for agriculture, and talking about what life was like for an Englishman. Yeah. As well as many, many amusing points about uh, about life back then. Yes, and and, and how uh, the the attitude of the English, you know, as a kind of bullheaded and stuck in their ways race of people is quite quite an interesting one, and also um, about like statements about what is right and what is proper, and complaints about things like uh, you know the rotundness of the middle aged Englishman. Uh, in in the 18th century, you know that sort of thing. Con, con, contrary to the idea that that everybody back then was starving and on the verge of death by by malnutrition. Mm, um, indeed, indeed. Uh, the, poor, the portly English innkeeper will always stay the same shape. So. It's, well, it's also interesting because it, it says something as well about the amount of work that you're expected to do when you were young, and then the amount mm. of work that you're expected to do as you aged. Um, and how, as you pass the uh, as you pass the sickle to the next generation, so to speak, your workload depreciates enough, but you're still eating the same amount, and you end up um, yes. uh, expanding as quite a, rapidly. As an as, a, as an ex rower, I'm very familiar with this problem. Um, <laughs> but yeah, as an ex soldier, so am I. <laughs> so, <laughs> goodness gracious. Uh, so we should be joined at some point this evening. I'm really hoping he has indicated his uh, desire to join us uh, by uh, Mr. John D. Uh, especially the venerable, the venerable D. The venerable John D. Who uh, is of particular note for this particular section because uh, we are covering food and drink, um, and food and drink obviously being the foundation of any nation's nutrition and thus their health and thus you know, their, their ability to do things. So um, it's also interesting from the point of view of uh, pre-war foodstuffs, because obviously Britain and England in particular went through a period of very, very strict rationing, which um, not only de decimated our kind of nation national cookbook, so to speak, you mm -hmm. know, if anyone complains that, um, that Britain that has no like national cuisine. One, they're completely idiotic because I could list off a dozen or more dishes which are native to Britain um, and presented in a British way. But yeah. um, secondly, a lot of our recipes were lost um, over this war time period when uh, everyone had access to the same ingredients um, and we'd mm -hmm. lost, lost a lot of other ingredients. And of course, we're in the industrial age where 
Um, we've lost a lot of our uh, our forestry and the, the national natural foresting skills. I mean, we talked last time about uh, the practice of wooding, which is what happens when the crops fail, uh, mm -hmm. and, and you go out with the rest of the town and you're basically foraging for things. And so uh, your natural and uh, sort of local knowledge of all your herbs, plants, uh, vegetables, wild berries, etc., uh, which would have been lost. Um, even though, you know, people did do this, but certainly in the cities and the larger towns, etc., it wasn't possible to do this. And so our national cookbook was, was somewhat reduced. So I'm really interested to see what uh, this section on food and drink uh, has to say about what food was like in the 18th century and uh, moving forward into the 19th. Uh, so, yeah, that's, that's the long and short of it. We'll see how far we go. Um, I'm not intending on making this you know like yeah we will go for two hours and or three hours and that will be that and then we shall stop at the place <laughs> no i'm going to try and take us through at a reasonable pace and when it feels appropriate to stop and make comments we'll stop and make comments and when it feels appropriate to end the section uh, or if a, another large section is coming up then we'll also do that i would i would estimate between two and three hours pro probably it wouldn't um, surprise me no. yeah um so Skowen has uh sent us in uh, 50 kroners, 70 kroners actually. Thank you very much, Sutskirtan. It says, life for an English man must have been better than with today's leaders, in quotes. Um, I certainly think that it was a lot more autonomous, um, although you did have to answer to the local lords and stuff like that. Um, it's very rare that you saw them. Um, and you instead uh, interacted with officials who came around and checked things at preordained parts of the year, but most of the time you're preoccupied with surviving and getting enough in to you know to make the most of what you've got going so um i think there's a lot less intervention <laughs> that it, it resulted in regulation in daily life to be perfectly honest yes. right shall we begin mr ham indeed indeed i think that's appropriate right i'm just going to double check that mr d has not messaged me he has not but uh we will see him i'm going to pop up now the uh, window capture and hopefully there we go right so we we can't see let me try and grab this yeah I'm going to shrink it down a little bit so people can see uh, between our two icons but um, yeah the text in this book won't exactly match up but it will uh, give us a, a kind of a flavor of what's going on and, and thankfully it will allow us to uh, display some of the the illustrations so I will try and uh, flick through at the appropriate time as you can see this older version has fewer illustrations and the food section is very descriptive so uh, mm -hmm. let's get going so we we finished last time talking about the Woodford diary so we're talking about uh, uh, Woodford's account here and Woodford is in Western so take that into account Woodford had not been long at Weston before he was invited to join the Rotation Club with two Bs, of which the members dined at one another's houses on Mondays. Just from a first sentence, I love the idea of this, by the way. I just, I love that the, you've invented a club. The whole reason for it to exist is just to socialise on a Monday evening and whoever's the next in line presumably it was a, caters. It was there was a there was a specific gap on a Monday night everyone needed to fill, so they were like, "Well, got a club together for this one." Yeah, we shall we shall name it an official, and we shall institutionalize it uh, and, and make it an official part of our our day with subsidies and everything. Amazing. Mm -hmm. um, this brings up the su subject of food, which plays a large part in Woodford's diary. Here is the bill of uh, fare of the first rotation dinner which Woodford gave when his, <clears throat> when his turn came on January the 20th, 1777. A couple of rabbits smothered with onions, a neck of mutton boiled, and a goose roasted with a currant pudding and a plain one. They drank tea in the afternoon, played a pool of quadrille after, drank a glass or two of punch, and went away about eight o'clock. Yeah, amazing. Punch uh, being a very popular drink back then. I imagine that there must have been quite a few attendees. I'm, I'm assuming he's not, um, 
you know, it's this, he's not putting this spread out and then consuming it all like him and a couple of mates. Uh, <laughs> him and two others. No. I, I'm assuming it's a, a proper membership who are, who are coming to do this. But yeah. you can clearly see, again, there's an, an eclectic um, sort of uh, amount of food available. Um, current puddings and general puddings uh, as a whole were very popular in Britain, still are, to be honest. And there's a reason why we call it our... Um, sort of dessert course pudding as well yes. um as opposed to anything else because we had so many things we had plum puddings currant puddings uh you know spotted dick was a kind of pudding um and then we had rice pudding and, and all the rest so um it made sense that that everything was called pudding even the things like you know tea and cake cakes <laughs> tea cakes and stuff well, like yeah. that i mean this is this is like even now we have the word pudding means innumerable things it could mean a a steak and kidney pudding. It could mean a chocolate cake at the end of a meal. It could mean fruit salad. You know what's what what's for pudding? It's one you know. of it's one of those things which very much confuses the Germans, and which I I enjoy. And in fact, most of Europe actually, because to them, pudding is a very specific de uh, dessert, uh, which is sort of like angel delight. Um, yes. And so, if if they say, oh, if you say, oh, what's for pudding <laughs> at a at a German meal tonight? <laughs> They always want pudding every night. You know, we can go out and get it for them, but, you know, it's a bit strange that they just have this great love of this one particular pudding, uh, this one particular dessert. Uh, it just amuses me. Um, here it is. Oh, okay. Here's, here's, so here's an interesting tidbit about this, uh, this Woodford Rotation Club. One rule was that the club did not add supper or give any tips to servants. So they, they literally had rules where like you couldn't tip you couldn't tip the servants uh what was called a veil um a veils uh was was tips uh and they didn't have supper supper of course being a meal that you would have between sort of 10 and 11 p.m so you had to eat like at dinner time which is uh, around this time actually around six yeah. o'clock uh and then you weren't going to stay for you know additional uh ad additional <laughs> leisure food essentially uh, and i presume that this gave the servants the time off which helped alleviate the fact that they weren't tipped <laughs> but yeah. uh interesting um it, this was an important detail for tipping was general and very expensive in the 18th century so they tried to keep costs mm. down for everyone okay. by not so this, tipping this, the servants this, so this was a bit like modern america then where like they they have this real complex about about like tipping big um, yeah, because I, you're, you're you're basically expected to pay the wages of the staff. I I imagine that there's something about it as well in that these are probably quite well-to-do gentlemen who are coming around and doing this uh, as part of this club, and so mm -hmm. there is a real danger of like the idea of poaching staff or predisposing servants towards a particular guest as opposed to others. Yeah. Um, or, in fact, uh, you know, if you've had a bit too much port and that sort of thing, um, uh, competitions for who can who can tip the most to the to the servants, which would be very nice for the servants, I'm sure, but would have caused considerable consternation amongst the uh, the, the rest of the household and jealousy from other servants and, and other stuff. Yeah. So, um, I imagine it was quite practical, as well as um, obviously the, as it being a money saving tactic on it on the whole. Mm -hmm. Um, breakfast. We move on to breakfast. Breakfast seems to have been a lighter meal. Oysters and tea and bread and butter, or cold tongue instead of oysters. Oh, oh I love I love cold tongue in a, t a tongue sandwich. Oof. This is going to be an especially difficult stream for me because I've not actually had my dinner yet. Um, <laughs> had my had my supper. I'm my going... tea. So, uh... I'm going to have given you many ideas for things that you can craft oh, throughout yeah. the week. That's the thing. Yeah, I'd love a bit of cold tongue. I love the idea that they just, you know, they sourced oysters for breakfast. You know, like it's it, to my oysters. mind, it, it's seen as very much an evening, afternoon kind of meal, um, especially with the kind of uh, reputation it has as an aphrodisiac and everything like that, where. You go, yeah, like that's an evening meal rather than, oh, I've woken up. I guess I'll sup on some oysters this morning. Well, I mean, oysters used to be kind of common man's food. 
Um, they were peasant food, especially if you lived on the coast, of course. You'd, you'd go out and pick them, I think, um, or get them from wherever you get them, and um, just eat them as fair. Um, and it wasn't... I, I'm sure if Mr. D were here, he'd be able to uh, explain this better than I could, and probably more accurately, too, but... Um, uh, it wasn't until the kind of 1800s they became known as a kind of, uh, you know, fancy French sort of, you know, haute, haute, uh, haute cuisine oh, in, right, the, uh, in, the, um, in the hotels and stuff. Ah, I see. Um, yeah, but maybe it was just a successful marketing campaign that, that rose them to the, to the, the, well, the position they had. It's because rich people started eating them. Mm, mm. That's why. And poor people worked out they could sell them to rich people for quite a lot of... <laughs> they worked out they could sell them to gullible middle-class people. Yeah, maybe, maybe. Yeah. Um, I also love the idea that, you know, you've eaten cold tongue and oysters and tea and bread and butter and it's considered light for the morning. <laughs> well, I mean, you probably wouldn't eat that much of it. I mean, it would be a fairly light meal. It would, you know, one, one or two pieces of bread and whatever on top of that, you know. Well, much much less quantity. I, I have no doubt, no doubt. At noon, then, at noon followed a snack. Dinners from two to three were heavy and were succeeded by tea drinking, as they should be, with yeah. cake perhaps. But supper around 9pm was quite substantial enough to be regarded as a second yeah. dinner. There you go. The food was all good and wholesome, though once Woodford complains of heartburn, after eating a pike with a sauce compounded of anchovy sauce, walnut pickle, and melted butter. <laughs> I mean, that is rather rich fare, isn't it? That is indeed. That sounds like a heartburn inducing meal, right there. Yeah. Again, he has a bad night after roasted lobster for supper. He tasted, par yeah. he tasted Parmesan cheese in 1779 for the first time and liked it. He and his contemporaries ate all the coarse fish. Tench was a favourite dish, as was pike, stuffed with a pudding in its belly. Of course, there was a pudding in the pike. Belly. I love that. Yeah. Um, again, note as well how many different varieties of like meat and fish that are being consumed. And then compare that to like our modern factory farmed diet where everyone's like, oh, you know, salmon is now cheap and available, right? So salmon is everywhere. Salmon yeah. and cod. Um, and you can get things, you know, like place and haddock and stuff like that if you want it. But, like, aside from those four, I'm a bit hard-pressed. I mean, tuna, obviously. But I'm a bit hard-pressed to, uh, to think of, like, the last time I saw, like, a whole pike and a whole tench and a whole, you know, all other, you know, big fish I'm talking about available for big meals. Obviously, I'm aware that you can get things like white bait and sardines and mackerel yeah. and stuff like that. Um, I am a little bit uh, a little bit sad, really, about that. Although, you know, there's always the option that you can go to a proper fishmonger and get that sort of thing. But um, Indeed. Uh, there's that. The men and women of the 18th century were enormous meat eaters, as you might be able to guess. There's, there's roast beefs. For example, on December 7th, 1790, Woodford paid 46 pounds and five shillings for one year's meat. <laughs> wow. And in the same period, spent 22 pounds, 18 shillings and sixpence for malt and only five pounds, seven shillings and sixpence for 48 stone of flour. Uh, a stone is 14 pounds. Yeah, so, that's, that, that's, that's the same as a modern stone, isn't it, in weight? Yes, yes. So it's, it's uh, 14 pounds, so it's quite a lot uh, of flour there. He, he may, of course, have provided the miller with his own wheat, which may have brought the cost of that down. Uh, as breast of veal and pork was three and a half pence per pound, uh, and hind quarter of lamb and turkey, four and a half pence per pound, turbot, six pence per pound, salmon, seven pence, and a pair of soles weighing one pound, plus three pence. Oysters, eight pence per score, uh, score being ten. Uh, and we can qu calculate the different quantities of food consumed using these values. There can be no doubt that far more people died of overeating in the 18th century than of starvation. They were continually taking rhubarb and vomiting. <laughs> wow. 
That's amazing. Again, uh, putting down the idea that you would have starved if you were a peasant uh, in, in the 18th century. Yes, indeed. People brewed their own beer, and for 30... Good, good quantity. And for 36 gallons, allowed one comb, uh, that's four bushu, bushels, or half a quarter, of malt and one and a half pounds of hops, large houses could brew eight barrels at a time. Mead was another homemade drink, 14 pounds of honey were put into four gallons. Should be, it, yeah, it, it, it should be noted that this mead and beer would have been a lot less alcoholic and a lot sweeter than modern beer. Um, yes, yeah, so it was one and a half to two. Drink that. One and, and, and a half this, to two percent. And this would have been given to everyone. Everybody would have drunk this as, as, as a staple. If you were thirsty, you would have reached for the beer, um, whether you were a child or an adult. Yes, because, but because, like... Because, because the alcohol content was so low. And also, when you, if you drink it from an early enough age, you become accustomed to it. So. I mean, it is a mild antiseptic, but the people did drink water as well. I mean, they they, they did, but beer is... was, I think, preferred just because it's nicer than water. You know. I mean, yeah, but it's it's also one of these strange misnomers that everyone was drunk in like every, every no, time from the, from the Middle Ages to the twentieth century. Um, in you fact, know. Um, public pub being be, being drunk in public was a punishable offence in many places. Indeed. Um, so yes, uh, here's how to make mead for anyone who's interested. 14 pounds of honey were put into four gallons of water with ginger and two handfuls of dried elderflowers, boiled for over an hour and skimmed meanwhile. So for anyone who doesn't know uh, what you do in order to produce these kind of things is uh, you boil up all of these ingredients together and a kind of I don't want to call it scum, but um, a byproduct floats up to the surface. Skim. Skim on the top. And so you skim it off. You get rid of it, and the whole mixture reduces as you do so. Um, and then it uh, is basically cooled into uh, by being put into a... In fact, it's going to tell us now. So the liquor was then poured into a tub to cool, and a large gravy spoon of fresh yeast added when it was almost cold. Kept in a warm place at night, the mead was drawn off the next day and put into the barrel. We have made mead from this recipe, and excellent stuff it is, with, curiously enough, a slightly beery flavour. So, yeah, that's the, uh, that, that's the process of making mead. Again, people talk about, oh, you know, how will you get by without refrigeration in this time? People had ways of keeping stuff cool. They did. Um, and they, they knew a lot. Of houses and rooms that were underground away from the sun. And they um, did have a, a curious, uh, curiously good knowledge of uh, fluid dynamics when it came to, you know, cooling things rapidly. So um, don't I wouldn't discount them. Tea, however, and you'll be surprised to know, was bought from smugglers. And even <laughs> then, cost nine shillings uh, and ten shillings, six pence a pound. Yeah. Popular and stuff. Uh, just to put that in perspective, a tub of gin, uh, a tub being 19 bottles and one pint, <laughs> <laughs> very specific, cost one pound and six shillings from the same source. Okay, so uh, there you go. And a half an anchor of rum, one pound, 15 shillings. Anchor of rum. An anchor of rum. I do like I'll that. I'll have an anchor of rum. Yeah. Let me, uh, let me see if I can move on to some illustrations so that people can enjoy those uh, as we go into the next section. There's a couple of images. You are unfortunately missing out on a picture of a wooden trencher, but we'll see. So it is uh, misleading to judge the drinking habits of the 18th century by those of our own time. Woodford's niece Nancy came to live with him. She had a bad knee and her doctor prescribed her a pint of port wine a day. Oh. To be on the right oh, side, she I, I, I'd like to say I am very healthy, and I always have a pint of port wine a day. So, uh, <laughs> so yes, I can I can back up Oof. that cure. Okay, it gets better because in order to stay on the correct side of her her prescribed dosage, okay, she drank between a pint and a quart, say one and a half pints, as medicine. Uh, the effects, however, were so marked and so unhappy that fortunately she soon abandoned this treatment. <laughs> No, she couldn't do it. Couldn't, she could, couldn't stand the medicine. Women. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, you know, maybe, maybe he could say, okay, you can, you can have half a pint a day. 
I, I love the idea that you'd be like, well, your knee must not be that bad again if you can't take your medicine. <laughs> exactly. Like, there's just this child. They're like, hey, I have a pint of poor today. <laughs> well, um, during the American Civil War, um, the cure for having a snake bite was to drink four pints of whiskey. Four and, uh, pints? Four pints of whiskey, and lots I... of men died, not from the snake bite, but from trying to drink four pints of whiskey and getting alcohol poisoning. I think, poison I think I would die drinking an entire pint of whiskey in one go, yeah. to be perfectly honest. <laughs> and uh, I, I, I believe that um, uh, General Grant passed orders to stop this happening among troops. Um... Because it was killing them. Because you have it. Because a snake bite, you might you you you, you might survive. Four pints of whiskey administered in, in, in quick succession will probably do you in. So. Well, there was there was that chap who there was a famous video um, a few years ago of a chap who took a bottle of Jack Daniels and downed a liter in one go. Uh, basically, straw pedoed the whole thing. Um, and, what, and what happened to him? Well, he said, "I was immediately drunk. He did survive." Uh, and then immediately very, uh, he, he wasn't sick because he had tried to keep it down, but his body immediately started shutting down. <laughs> I can imagine, yeah. And they, 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 so like they like called... An stomach, basically. So they called the police and immediately had his stomach pumped, but apparently he was in a real bad way. <laughs> I, know, I imagine that is near, like, suicide levels of just trying to down a body. And keep it, keeping it down is the incredible thing, because, like, whenever I... Whenever I have a bit too much, you know, I mean, that's what happens, isn't it? Your 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 body says, "Okay, that's enough. <laughs> not not doing this," and uh, up it comes. But um, I mean, keeping keeping down that bottle. Also, <laughs> Lum <laughs> Lumberg says, "Was it was 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 it, was it kid? Was it?" Uh, <laughs> uh, no, I don't think it was uh, our our venerable <laughs> member from the the VC. Yeah. No. I can see him doing that, though. Oh, I hope not. I hope you had a bit more sense than to do that. Goodness. So, uh, where were we? Yes, so his daughter abandoning the treatment. Uh, okay, so we're now going to talk about uh, table accompaniments and how the food was prepared. So, all 18th century table appointments were beautiful. The china, stoneware and silver have never been bettered but these must have been kept for the parties. In the Lonsdale magazine, 1822, oh, Lonsdale, how far you've fallen. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes. We learned that the richer sort of people had a service of pewter, but amongst the middling and poorer classes, the dinner was off re often eaten off uh, wooden trenchers, so wooden plates, uh, turned out of sycamore. Now, I don't have a picture of it for you here, but it essentially just imagine a... A big flat uh, plate is about eight, eight and a half inches across. Uh, whilst dealing with food, we will return to the question of the veils or tips that were not allowed at the dinners of the Rotation Club. Tips must have made a substantial addition to 18th century wages. One tipped after a dinner party and on every other possible occasion. Yeah, generousness to the staff. Yes, and to... Um, and to everyone, really, you know, if you had a horseshoes made or something like that, you would probably have tipped, etc. They seem to have. A... Well, the, the the thing to remember is that for a lot of servants, wages were negligible, and in some cases weren't paid at all, um, because basically you were pay you were paying the servant in room and board. Yeah. Uh, because they would be given a room in your house, and you would feed them and and clothe them and things, and you would provide all their necessities. So. Tips were essentially the wage. Like that that's 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 their spending money is tips from patrons. And indeed, um these tips could be enormous. Um and I believe up until the fifties in, in France, um waiters, for example, in restaurants and hotels didn't get paid wages. Oh, um see. they didn't get wages, they it was entirely subsisted off tips. And what this meant was that some of the more famous waiters, the kind of head waiters that would be well known among the fancy sort of clientele, could end up earning huge amounts of money. Um, yes. Because they were famous, they were in demand, and you know it, it was a privilege to be waited on by a particularly famous he head waiter or you know somebody who really knew the trade. So yes, you know, yes. if, if, if if a wealthy you know newspaper baron came down, you could get a tip of like forty thousand francs for a dinner. You know. 
or some, something like that. Some, because, of course, it, 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 then became a, it then became a kind of symbol of your wealth that you could tip extravagantly, you know, yes, to uh, yes. wait and the cooks and things. Well, it was, it was a profession. And I remember yeah. even as, even as uh, late as even the 1990s, um, the, there were people, I knew a guy who had gone to France to train professionally as a waiter. And you'd, you'd think, like, how much is there involved in professionally waiting? Oh, and they need to know an enormous amount in order to do it properly and to work in it's, certain places. Um, it's, it's, it's an art form, really, in some places. Yes, uh, it, it's just it's the speed and the efficiency. It is things like to the point where when you take an order, uh, a mark of the true waiter was that they did not write down anything. They memorized the entire order. They memorized the names and the places of everyone at the table. And, and they, the specifics of the order. And the specifics of the order. And yeah, then when they... I want this without mushrooms or whatever, then... And when they returned, okay. they would serve in order, uh, in, a, in a specific order, and they would also bring across the cutlery uh, for that, uh, you know, if it hadn't been a, a set dinner with, you know, three courses with a very, special thing. Very, very hard job. Very, very, very di difficult, and, mentally stressful job. And very physically demanding as well, because they were expected to carry, you know, enormous amounts of food around without ruining the presentation. And and, and, and they, they work for long, long hours, uh, yes. traditionally. They, they work all day. And they have to look impeccable the entire time and never flustered. So yep. it's... Never, never flustered, never, never sweaty. Um, and uh, I believe in, in, in George Orwell's book, uh, Down and Out in Paris and London, he notes that the Parisian hotel staff, some of them only got four hours of sleep or less a night um, because the work just never stopped. You know, even, even when the dinner room is closed, there's, there's cutlery to polish, there's, there's cloths to clean, there's tables to scrub, there's floors to, to sweep. You know, the, it, the work never ends. And uh, so, yes, a, 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 an unexpected snapshot there into the life of... Uh, of wait stuff. Um, carrying on though, uh, we will talk about uh, the tips then. So let's let's return to the tips. Um, one tip after a dinner party and on every other possible occasion. Wages may seem very low until you remember the value of 18th century money. A maid was paid five pounds per year and perhaps picked up as much more uh, and perhaps picked up as much more, right? So she, her wage was essentially doubled by tips. Yeah, by tips. A charwoman's wage was six pence a day. So the, the person who uh, literally shovels charcoal. Food yeah, leads. And us... that was that, that, that was considered a very um, a very lowly um, pr profession, by the way. Mm. Um, being a charwoman generally meant you were on hard times. Uh, food leads us naturally to cooking, but there we find no important developments during the 18th century. In a country parsonage, they probably cooked their food in much the same way as shown in figure 18. Figure 18 is... Let's see. This is the trouble with them going back and forth. Yes, there is an image back on um, about 10 pages ago. Bear with me one second, so we'll try and... Is there anywhere we can... Um... Oh, yes, there it is. So you've got the screen share going. Yes, yeah, so on the left-hand left, left -hand, uh, page here, I appreciate that it is uh, sideways. In fact, I'll try and uh, rotate this transform, rotate to 90 degrees. There we are. You can see this image here. So this is uh, the kitchen, a dog turned spit at an inn kitchen in Newcastle <laughs> in South Wales. Yes. Um, hang on, let me zoom in on the image there. The, uh, uh, yes, there we go. Um, yes, I see it. About eighteen hundred. There we go. Yes, that's the that's the dog up in the. There's um there's all sorts of jokes in historical manuscripts about things like. Um, because you have a little dog that's supposed to turn the wheel, but well, what would happen if you put a, uh, like a greyhound or something in there? <laughs> and the meat just flies off. The, <laughs> oh, I see. Sauce going everywhere. Yeah. The dog. The dog is up. So, so for people who haven't clocked it, the, there's the dog a, is up the top there. There is a, a, a at the top. You can see the spit going, and there's a little turn wheel in the wall where the dog <laughs> is that's running around and keeping it spinning on time. 
That's a wonderful little uh, little addition there. Amazing. Um, right. Where is this? Why is this not? That is funny, isn't it? I, I'd, I'd love to see a spit in a kitchen with like a whole pig on it just being turned by a dog. I just like the idea of, like, I imagine uh, health and safety hygiene standards, you know, they wouldn't be particularly happy. So what you need is the dog to be in another room. So, like, it needs to be a commercial kitchen, right? Where right. E everything looks super professional um, and, and super is, well is, done. Is, is, is this somewhere you work? Or? No, no, no. This is what it needs to look like uh, okay. in, in your example, right? And there's the spit going, but the, the, uh, the actual turn uh, spile goes through the wall. And then, you know, it's like nobody goes in this back room. And when you go in there, there's just a wooden wheel with a dog. In it. it's, like, it's just a very tired dog. It's been turning it for 25 years, you know. Like, <laughs> oh, God. The marathon runner dog. All right. Yeah, that's, yeah. There's the dog, right. They're not eating the dog. Meh. <laughs> okay. So, um... Right, so th this showed a dog uh, turning the spit. Uh, in the other turn spits, power was supplied by weights, which had to be wound up. Yeah, we, like a clock. We illustrated a beautiful specimen of this type in volume two, unfortunately. We are reading volume three. Uh, perhaps the house boy was sometimes called the skip jack because he had to skip to this <laughs> type of jack to wind it up. Skip, I, I, I love job names like that. You're a skip jack. You skip jack, jack old skip boy. Jack. Yeah. Skip Jack. Uh, <laughs> meat was roasted in front of the fire and basted as it turned around on the spit, and the fat that dripped out of it into the pan underneath was called dripping. Uh, for those of us who are northern northern viewers, you're very familiar with dripping, beef dripping sandwiches. Uh, you know, dri bread, bread and dripping is very popular as a, an Englishman. Um, Figure 22 shows a very simple arrangement where the spit was turned. So this is this, uh, uh, this, this woman up here with the, uh, the charcoal and the spit and hand turning it. Yeah. Shows a very simple arrangement where the spit was turned by a boy. Sorry, a boy, not a woman. Figure 20, uh, now comes a problem. In 1787, Woodford had two stoves put up in his kitchen. Were these the newfangled kitchen ranges that we discuss on page 176? Knowing that we're on page 43 and they haven't mentioned this before. Um, it seems rather doubtful, for such ranges were probably for the smaller houses than beginning to be built in the industrial towns. Uh, then beginning to be built in the industrial towns, right? So they, they built ranges in new homes. Uh, in the country, the old open fire and roasting continued for a long time. Over the fire hung a great kettle on an adjustable handle, yes. uh, which is this figure here, figure 24. Um, uh, for, of course, there was no boiler and no tap over the kitchen sink. The kettle was fitted with an ingenious little contrivance by which it could be tipped to pour out the boiling water. So you could touch, you could basically pour your boiling water without scalding yourself. Yeah, yeah, uh, so it, was, it, yeah it could be quite complicated. Um, uh, you know, it could be poured out. Um, a cauldron or frying pan could be su suspended in a similar way for boiling meat or making porridge. And again, I believe there's an illustration on the next page. There we are, suspended frying pan there. Uh, Papin's digesters may have continued in use. I do not know what a Papin digester is. Are you familiar with that? Uh, digester. A digester. Papin's uh, digester. I'm gonna have to. I'm sure, I'm sure Mr. D would know, but um, I know Papin digester. Let's let's try it. I'm looking up for it now. Yeah. Oh, it's a steam-powered digester, also known as Papin's digester. A, a pressure cooker. It's basically an old pressure cooker. Um, I think because it says it's French. Papin's digester, maybe. Papin. I will. I'm... So it's basically a, a pressure cooker. Yeah. Yes, I'm just bringing up a uh, an image of it now on the on the screen. Amazing. There we go. So this is this is sort of what it looked like. Very um, industrial <laughs> looking, quite convoluted in terms of uh, uh, aesthetically pleasing. Though I would say quite aesthetically pleasing. I like this one. Uh, this sort of this bigger one here, where yeah. 
it's a, clearly a more modern design to, to the same thing, but um, yeah, very good, very good. Uh, right, let's return return to the book. So, Papin's Digest has made continued news. John Evelyn, the di diarist, mentions how on April 12th, 1682, he went to a supper with several members of the Royal Society, where all the food, both fish and flesh, had been cooked in a digester with less than eight ounces of coal. The digester was a really it was really a very large saucepan, having an airtight lid fitted with a safety valve. Evelyn says that the hardest bones were made as soft as cheese, that the food was delicious, and that this philosophical supper caused mirth amongst us. Inevitably, all the pots and pans used over a coal fire got filthily black and dirty. So this was another way of keeping your food clean and uh, yeah. and, and so on. So it's, it's an interesting one. I mean, I love a good slow-cooked meal. I don't know about you, uh, Mr. Hat, if you, if you are, are a student of the, of the slow cooker. Um, I have been meaning to invest in one for some time. But uh, the trouble is, I, I just I always just use use a pot on the stove. I will say there's nothing quite like a properly slow cooked meal. Um, no, it, it is good. I, I I used to live with somebody that had one, and uh, I used to use it all the time. If you I just you can take any quality of like beef, usually um, just you know bog standard chuck chuck steak and um, and tenderloin, because at the end of the day, it's going to fall apart and mm -hmm. just absolutely uh, reduce down. And you have that with a great gravy, plenty of carrots and potatoes, and you reduce it all down with some red wine as well, I should add. And it becomes this gorgeously rich and very, very filling um, sort of stew that you can have with dumplings or mashed potato or, or other, other accompaniment. And just... Oh, so good. I know people like it with mushrooms. I'm not a big fan of mushrooms, but that's that's also another way to do it. Just makes gorgeous stuff. It does, of course, take, you know, eight to ten hours to cook anything, but, you know, yeah. it's worth it. It's worth it. 18th century baking was done in the brick oven. This was built on the side of the open fire so that the smoke from the oven, when it was lighted, could escape up the main chimney. The oven itself was circular in plan, uh, any, let me see if there's a... Oh, excuse me. Didn't mean to... to yeah. Right, so here's one of those ovens there, a camp oven. Uh, the oven itself was circular in pan and domed over in brick. A bundle of faggots was put inside the oven. So that's a, that's a, that's a bundle of sticks. Yes. But a bundle of faggots was put inside the oven and lighted with hot ashes. When these had burned themselves out, the hot ashes were raked and into the oven went the bread and all the pies and cakes, and any entrance was closed by an iron door. And as there was no chimney from the oven or escape for the imprisoned heat, except through this doorway, the cooking was done. The principle, in fact, was almost precisely as that of the cooking hole outside the huts in the new Stone Age, where, after the fire had burnt itself out, the food was cooked by turfs heaped over the hole. When young, one of the authors spent a considerable time in a farmhouse in Kent, and in this way, learn to love the land and farmers and all their doings. Oh, yes. if only kids see Kent learn, now. But yes. <laughs> learn to love the land. Dear God. I didn't even think about it. We don't talk about Hastings. Um, we the, don't mention it. No. The loaves there were made of homegrown wheat. Yes, I know Hastings is in East Sussex. Um, the, the loaves <laughs> there were made of homegrown wheat, ground into flour in the local windmill. Their shape was that of large buns. The colour of the bread was greyish. Its texture was close, and its smell most appetising, and it possessed remarkable stain powers. <laughs> mm. I like the idea that, like, that's a, it's a very poetic way of saying it doesn't go stale very quickly, you know. Yes. I like that. This is how, this is how men, this is how men should write, you know. Mm. Always, al always find a nice expression for things. Well, my grandfather is an author, and he, um, he said one of the things that he tried to do every day was to find a new way of... He'd go out on morning walks and find a new yeah. way of describing something ordinary. Yeah. This uh, is... This is I, I, I like to do this as well. As a, as a poet and author myself, I, it's just, just, just looking at... Because the, the magic of, of art, generally the written art, is in finding something wonderful in the mundane. So... 
just practicing that ability to look at something and find something incredible in it. If if if, if, if you want a masterclass in in this, but by the way, um, read a book by G.K. Chesterton, which is free online and it's very short, called Tremendous Trifles. Um, <laughs> I love that Chesterton wrote a book called Tremendous Trifles. This is my favorite thing. Yeah, Tremendous Trifles. Um, and uh, it contains many different. Uh, we maybe we could do a stream on it when when we finish this uh, this uh, the, the, the the agricultural stuff because it's it's very cozy. Mm. Um, and uh, it, it in it he 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 does things like he had this m in, I extreme power where he said, for example, that he could look out of the window and have enough material to write several books. You know, yeah, um, I love that. Yeah. And um, and he, for example, like he's on a train. Uh, and he and he goes through his pockets and comes up with enormous philosophical insights. And there's a, there's an idea where he 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 goes out to the countryside to like sketch some cows with his with his chalk, and realizes that he's forgotten the the vital white chalk to make any chalk drawing look good. And he's cursing himself. And then he starts laughing because he remembers that England is a giant piece of chalk. So he <laughs> so he, re he reaches down and pulls some off the rock. Yes. <laughs> you know, oh, that's amazing. Like that. Yeah. Oh, that's phenomenal. Yes, we will have to... Living, living on a piece of chalk. Yeah. We'll have to do that, certainly. Fantastic stuff. Uh, whether any other ovens were used besides the large brick ovens, we can't say. Camp ovens, as you can see there in figure 26, uh, were advertised for sale by the Caron Company of Falkirk in 1782. Is it Falkirk or Falkirk? I forget. Um, I, I think it's Falkirk. I think it's Falkirk. Um, it's hard to tell in a Scottish accent. Uh, and they'll, they... they'll, they'll, they'll be angry with us either way. <laughs> <laughs> and they tell us that uh, the Caron Company tell us they still sell these ovens for use in the country places in Ireland, Australia, and New Zealand. I do wonder um, if they still. Sorry. 1952. You do okay. wonder if they still in business today. Yeah. Um, but yes, uh, made of cast iron, their sizes vary from 6 to 24 inches in diameter and they are provided with a cover, much like a saucepan lid. Pushed into the glowing ashes of an open fire on their short feet, they are used for baking, frying, stewing, or boiling. It would be excellent practice for the juvenile members of a family living in the country to invest in a camp oven, build a camp around it, and see if they can bake, fry, stew, and boil, all in this wonderful implement. If, you. The, if the eggs and bacon became mixed up with the stew, what matter? It would be sooner than later. That is all. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Oh, that's uh, amazing. Um, forgive me, chaps. I'm going to run and grab myself another glass of water. Uh, well, shall, a, I, as... shall I take this opportunity to make some tea? Yes, uh, we will be back in, in just a moment, chaps. So please don't go anywhere. But uh, we, Do we'll... you have any sort of like holding tune you could play? Unfor nothing which is uh, copyright free, unfortunately, at the moment. But I shall, I shall pop. Please wait on the uh, on the, on the screen, and uh, we will adieu, adieu for Faithful. two two or three minutes. There we go. All right. Um, if you want, it's actually a poem called "Please Hold." I can read when we get back. Your, if you get back before me, please feel free to wax lyrical, Mister Hand. Fantastic. All right. Fabulous. All right. We'll be back in All a right. second, chat. Yeah, back in a sec.
I am back, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, whilst we just wait for Mr. Hat for a second here, um, I'd just like to take this opportunity to thank everyone who's tuned into the stream. I hope you're enjoying it immensely. I'm certainly enjoying going through this material, learning about a different era in England, and of course, the company of my, my good co-host. Um, if you'd like us to cover sort of anything else when we finish this book eventually, then uh, do please do please let me know. Um, and also let me know what your sort of favourite sort of tidbit of history has been so far. That would be nice to know. That would be great. Ah, oh, just a little bit of ice cold water there. Always appreciated. It's a shame so far that Mr. Mr. D has been unable to join us, but he does uh, assure me that he will be there at some point in the near future. But uh, audio is all right for everyone, I hope, and everything. Nearly there. I'm sure he will return to us soon, Mr. Hatfield. A double raspberry magnum. I did have a knockoff off brand white chocolate magnum earlier myself, Mr. Lumberg. Do recommend an ice cream, especially in this hot weather. It is toasty warm at the moment, and whilst I very much do enjoy the heat, to, to call it uh, sweltering would be a bit of an understatement, and I know many people will be laughing, laughing at the poor Englishman suffering in poor 25 degree heat. But uh, the air is something different over here, and you definitely do feel it. Definitely do feel it. Not quite like the Mediterranean, where you can uh, happily absorb 35 and not be worried at all. It is disgustingly warm and has been since February. Hello. I mean, it was very enjoyable since so going. It was. I, I enjoyed my time in Denmark coming over to say hi. Uh, good evening, Mr. Hat. Welcome you back. Went to Denmark. I did Denmark. indeed. Denmark. This is another story, um, but indeed. one that will be saved for another time, uh, as it's not the the topic of this stream. But um, yes, no. it was nice. Um, what tea have you gone with today? Well. Everyone's uh, everyone's going to get very upset about this, but um, I didn't use any of my fancy teas, any of my lovely Kenyan loose leaf. I just had a single bag bag of PG tips because sometimes I like supermarket brand teas. You, you we're, need we're actually we're actually we're very lucky in this country because even the cheap supermarket builders teas are actually very well blended. You you and also very fresh I think I think as well when you're using PG tips as a benchmark for tea, uh, or you know 
uh, Yorkshire tea or um, any of the sort of standard standard brands. I'm I'm quite partial to uh, sort of any kind of Twinings uh, standard blend as well yeah. myself. No, we're... The, the only brand I refuse to drink is Lipton, because it's disgusting. <laughs> um, but, but, but other than that, I'm not a snob at all when it comes to tea. I, I, will drink, I will drink the tea of kings, and I will drink the tea of commoners, and I will not complain either way. And um, it, it, it's, all are lovely. It, they're all lovely, yes. And with that muddy, um, muddy brown gold that it is. Yes. Indeed, it is gold. In fact, uh, a bit of an anecdote. When I was in Japan, when I, I briefly lived with a, a family there on an exchange. And um, when they came over here, the, the, the boy who was staying with me, he brought me a lovely watch as a gift. Oh. And I said, oh, and I said, well, when, when I come to see you, you know, what, what sort of things shall I get you as a gift? And he said, listen, don't worry about expensive gifts. He said, just get, get as much tea, uh, Yorkshire tea, Sarsons vinegar, and Cadbury's milk chocolate as you can through, through the airport, okay? Just do that. <laughs> so, so I, so indeed I did. I stuffed my suitcases with Yorkshire tea, Sarsons vinegar. I do have a big uh, bottle of Sarsons downstairs. Yes. Yes, and uh, I was I was stopped on the way, and they said, "What are you doing with this amount of tea?" And I said, "It's a gift." And they said, "Okay." Um, and so I took it over there, and indeed they enjoyed it. And uh, we, the, the mother was so in, she she served Yorkshire tea for breakfast every morning. And um, once I said I said to her, "Well." Could I try some of your local teas? You know, the sort of Japanese yeah, yeah. tea. Obviously, Japan is a country famous for its tea. And she just sort of, she sort of stood back and went, "Yorkshire tea is best tea," and then walked away. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I, I love that. Yeah, amazing. Yeah. Um, yes, uh, my my standard at the moment. I'm working my way through a box of uh, Twining's Lady Grey. Uh, just a, a, t a touch of that added sweetness for a bit of uh, orange rind. Uh, I find makes it quite nice. So there's there's Indeed. that. Anyway, shall we shall we return to our journey through the ages? Our discussion. Our discussion. So there is an interesting cooking note in the Woodford diary. Nancy yeah. had been making jam. I have also made plenty of jam. Jam is a grand, uh, grand jams and preserves tradition. A great, um, a great of our country. Um. So yes, definitely. Um, and afterwards complained of giddiness after making the jam. Woodford thought she was too long at the stove where charcoal was burning, though. The outward door was open all the time. He meant the kitchen door, since the stove was probably no more than a raised brick hearth on which charcoal fires could be made, and saucepans used over them on tripod stands. Such a raised hearth could be seen in the old kitchen at Hampton Court, Remember that a saucepan started life as a small deep pan with a handle, in which sauces could be made. When Nancy made red currant jelly, she used four pounds of currants, four pounds of best lump sugar, which cost one shilling and two pence, per pound. She also made cakes, tarts, custards and jellies when she and her uncle had a party. The plum pudding served at tithe frolics were made of one pound of some raisins, one pound of suet, one pound of flour, and two eggs. All the household washing was then done at home, and there was a wash day every five weeks. If our ancestors changed their clothes as frequently as we do, they must have had a tremendous amount to wash, but we don't think that they did. There is an amusing note in Boswell's Life of Johnson. Yeah, John now there's a classic. There's a classic, The Life of Johnson. Johnson was talking with Dr. Burney about the poor mad poet Kit Smart, one of whose failings was that he did not love clean linen. <laughs> <laughs> and Johnson, right. Johnson added, frankly, I have no passion for it. However that may be, there was enough in the Woodford household to employ two washerwomen for two days, paid sixpence a day each, plus breakfast and dinner. The ironing done by the maids not took bad, an additional bad. two days. Hmm. Uh, not a bad job if you can get it. Yes. No. Um, remember, of course, the the ironing, um, the ironing had to be done with a heated, li literally like a block iron. You p people have probably seen them. You know, like it's actually just a block of iron yes. that you put in the fire, heat it up, and then put it on the clothes. Um, it could take it could take a long time. 
You have to be careful with it as well. You don't want, to, don't want things to be too flammable now. It's just, it's just a heated block of iron. <laughs> Uh, you know, make make do with what you've got. I imagine it was quite a workout actually moving such a thing over yeah. over over clothing, especially the thick kind of clothing that they have then as well. Uh, yes. When the chimneys wanted sweeping, the chimney sweep came with his boy, who climbed up his boy, who climbed up <laughs> boy, hat hat get up the chimney, <laughs> get, get up the chimney hat. Gonna earn you a keep, boy. <laughs> I, 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 I'd, I'd be, I'd be a terrible chimney. I'm, I'm, I'm too, I'm too, uh, too sizable to go up a chimney. You have, you, you have to have a tiny, like waifish boy. Wiry frame, up. yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, not your, not your ample proportions. No, <laughs> I am, a, I am a country squire, fond of roast beef and port, so. Uh... And a bit too old for such things now, I imagine. Yeah, probably. Oh my goodness. <laughs> yes. There's some, unfortunately, there's no uh, images uh, in here of, of the uh, of, of the chimney sweep. But we have some interesting stuff here for, for brewing in a moment. So mm. uh, when, when the chimney sweep came with his boy, who climbed up the flue, brush in hand, Woodford wrote that when his sweep Holland came to him, he had a new boy Holland. with him. <laughs> Holland? When he had a new boy with him who had likely to have lost his life this morning at Western House in sticking in one of their chimneys, I gave the poor boy a shilling. <laughs> it's like, you nearly died up my chimney? Oh, you have poor thing. You have, a shilling. Shilling. <laughs> have a shilling. Have a shilling, boy. Uh, in the 19th century, when brushes were introduced, the sweeps who used the new brooms called themselves... Mechanical chimney sweeps. I love it. Ooh. A very imperious ring to it. As mechanical well, chimney sweeps. As well as the cooking and washing that had to be done, there was butter making. The milk brought in and poured out into large pans and was then scalded over a copper. As you can see in 36, which is apparently a, a while away, so uh, I don't have an image of that just yet. And then placed in the dairy to cool. The cream was skimmed by a flat skimmer and came off in thick, golden folds. For a minute it was held, while the milk drained away through holes in the skimmer. And then the cream went into a crock, and the skim milk into the swill tub for the pigs. I love that. It's something Peter Hitchens would approve of, well, wouldn't it? Well, there's, there's nothing... Like, you can't really afford to just waste stuff. Like, I mean, we, we do live in an age where we will just throw away gargantuan amounts of things, largely because we use stuff that isn't really... I, I know it's become a leftist word, but, you know, sustainable. Um, but, I mean, you know, all the waste food fed to the pigs, and the pigs you can have more food out of later. You know, it's, it's, a, kind of, it's a kind of harmonious, balanced equation, isn't it? It, it is, but that's not really what I was referencing. What I was referencing is the fact that skimmed milk was only good enough for the pigs. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I see what you mean, yes. Indeed. Disgusting white water. <laughs> uh, the cream... The, the skimmed milk was put in the swill tub for the pigs, and the cream went into the churn, and figure 27... So I'm gonna, gonna spin this round so that uh, we can... We can see it again. Let me. Uh, why is this not letting me select it? There we go. Uh, let me rotate this again so we can we can see it properly. There we are. Nice. Now, this is quite quite an elaborate contraption here. With that, you can see the uh, the horse of the donkey, um, which is is doing the churning to because churning by hand is an absolute mission. So we've got the uh, the big churner here. So the cream went into the churn, and figure 27 here shows a churn of one horsepower. One yes. whole horsepower. One horsepower. But generally the farmer's wife supplied the power that turned the handle. The churns were either of plunger or barrel design. Sorry, can you still hear me, Mr. Hand? Uh, yes, I can still hear you. I, well, I, 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 mute, I mute it because I, I had to uh, type a message to someone, and I didn't want the typing to... I see. It's just that your background noise suddenly disappeared, and I feared for my internet connection. Yes, anyway. I'm sorry about that. It, it, I can't because because it's quite a hot day. My computer fans are working at uh, a higher voltage than they normally do. A so. mile a minute. That's fine. 
Yeah, sorry uh, about that. And, and also, there's lots of people walking about uh, outside cars and going up and down the lane, and there's birds chirping around. Sorry about that. Yeah. Uh, generally, the farmer's wife supplied the power that turned the handle. The churns were either of plunger or barrel type, mounted on a stand, and inside the barrel, long blades beat the cream into butter. Sometimes it took a long time for the butter to come, but when it did and the churn was opened, the butter was found like granulated crumbs in the buttermilk. This mm. butter was then taken out and washed, smacked into pats to give it the shape in the kitchen sink, which was a very large one made of stone. Instead of water taps, there was a pump, and the handle was plied to pump up the water needed to wash the butter, and wooden platters, bowls, pats, and moulds were used to give it shape. Most of the utensils were made of wood or earthenware, for enamelled iron had not been invented. Figure 28 shows a wooden measure, so this is the uh, this mug down here. A wooden measure. Uh, in Norfolk, the butter was sold by the pint rather than the pound. So pint they, butter, so, which is still, still the case in some places. Hence why they have these, uh, literally a pint mug made of wood that they used to, to pack the butter in. Pint of butter, there yeah. There you go. Um, let me uh, just pull down to this aesthetically pleasing image here, the, the butter being churned. Skimmed milk introduces the subject of pigs and pig killing. Pigs mean pork, bacon, sausages, and various edible oddments. For example, South denoted pickled pig's feet and ears, and black puddings are as old as the hills. The goat's bellies filled with fat and blood mentioned in the Odyssey were the black puddings of their day. <laughs> Wow. What other history book? It, 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 sort of like, uh, it, it's not even necessarily a history book, but like just general guide to living is going to reference the Odyssey as part of it. I love it. I love it. <laughs> um, all of this should make it plain that the 18th century housewife had to know her job. And again, this is also the thing about, uh, which I deeply dislike about like the feminist uh, interpretation of uh, certainly... Um, Mid millennial, mid, mid millennium living mm -hmm. is like this idea that women were bought and sold like cattle and abused and everything like that. Like the women worked hard and they looked after their households and they had a lot of responsibility. Um, it was not that they were kept, you know, like slaves in a back shed somewhere and told that they couldn't go out and see their friends. You know, they lived busy lives. They did. They did. Um enormous uh, social networks and webs, uh, far more than we, we have today. This is what always interests me, is people act like the people of the past lived in slavery. It's we who live in slavery, <laughs> and we are we are heading closer every day. I wouldn't even call it slavery. We live in bondage in a different yeah. way. In a we're, different we're, way. We're serfs to, like, you know, Amazon or whatever. Um, well, thank thankfully we aren't, but yes. <laughs> well, you know, it, it could happen to anyone. Um, okay. Uh, yes, yeah, so the, the 18th century housewife had to know her job. Almost everything was done at home, and little help came from outside. Yes. Wood, Woodford, of course, was fortunately placed, for he was a bachelor. Ooh, okay. And lone men have an uncanny knack of finding devoted women who will work their fingers to the bone for them. You know, that's not that's not untrue. I I experience of this <laughs> I um for, for the first year or so I lived here I had a um a woman who I knew, knew since I was a kid who was a who works l locally who used to come and clean for me and did and ended up doing a lot of other stuff um you know I it, it's it's quite shocking but uh, that was that was that was in the past so well, the, the sordid history of, of Mr. Hat coming to the fore there. Um, <laughs> I wish it were the case for me. I, <laughs> I mean, mm. I've, I, I, I've had my fair share of attention for the ladies, but not in the last couple of years of late. Uh, <laughs> well, it, 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 it been a, it's been a funny couple of years, though, isn't it? True, very true. Um, hopefully, hopefully we'll find something soon. Anyway, mm. um, I, I love the idea that, like, like it's not that it's, it's again it's a complete inversion of a lot of what women will expect these days to be waited upon hand and foot and this strange idea that uh 
as a bachelor, he would find a woman who was willing to work for him, you know, work hard for him to work, uh, you know, towards, uh, towards making him happy. Yeah, exactly. As there were very few labour-saving appliances, housework... Yes, of course, this is the thing. Yes, housework in any form was very much harder than it is today. Take lighting, for instance. Today, you enter a room and merely turn down the electric switch. In the 18th century, they had only candles, snuffers, uh, and snuffers were used to keep the wicks trim. That's right, that's right. But the candles often guttered in drafts, and candlesticks need daily cleaning. Though the light was soft and beautiful, many candles were required to make a good light. Primitive oil lamps were also used. We should like to close this chapter with a strong recommendation to our readers to read the Woodford Diary for themselves. There are five volumes, but once you've got into the rhythm of the story, you may find that you've begun to long for more. We know of no other book that gives so true a picture of 18th century everyday life in the country. Whilst there are many other diaries, some gossipy, others scandalous, some political, some military, there is only one Woodford. He describes not only the life in the village, but its government by squire and parson, a thing that the radicals used to shudder at, but that, now it has almost vanished, seems less terrible in days gone by. Many modern types of local government may strike us as a good deal more tyrannical than a mild autocracy practised by customs, the squire of Weston. Evidently he belonged to the class of whom Cobbett wrote, as the resident native gentry attached to the soil and knowing the people. If the squires enjoyed the privileges of their order, they accepted their responsibilities too, and played providence in an amiable fashion. It's a beautiful ending to a chapter, really. Yes, uh, indeed. This, this is a wonderfully rewritten book, very elegant prose. I'm, I'm very pleased with it so far, and um, I hope that others are enjoying it as well. I think we definitely have time to do another section. Um, and this is uh, chapter two, the official chapter two, on building, because if you recall at the beginning, in the foreword, they talked about the three sort of big trades, the the, the grand uh, trades yeah. of, let me see here, uh, something along the lines of, dear me, uh, all other trades are, yeah, here we are. So there's farmers, there's builders, and there's clothing, and everything else is uh, subsidiary or unimportant compared to these three things. So, right, okay. so um, those are your main departments of spending, so to speak. Yeah, so like, if you can get those three things right, then everything else can, that, that follows is essentially a luxury. Um, and, you know, because if you have a, ha a house over your head, clothes on your back, and you can eat well, then you're, you're doing pretty well, to be honest. All right, yeah. Right. Building, ladies and gentlemen. So, we can now pass on to the building trade, the second of the three great trades we are considering, and during the 18th century a very important one indeed. Every, mm -hmm. every man of taste, I think you should describe yourself from now on as a man of taste, Pamela. I, I am, I'm, I am a man of taste. I, but the, the thing is that I, you, you, you shouldn't have to describe yourself as a man of taste, you know. It, 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 it's like describing yourself as a gentlemen it's like other people ascribe that to you um you don't you don't really call yourself one as such well, uh, you, but you yes could, yes the man who calls himself the man of taste is neither um, <laughs> <laughs> uh right so every man of taste took especial pride in the possession of a fine house and even though not an architect himself was familiar with the rules of architecture as laid down by andrea palladio Born in Vicenza in 1518, Palladio did most of his work there and died in 1580. His book, A Quattro Libre dell'Architettura, published in Italy in 1570 and in England in 1676, became the Bible of the later Renaissance. This is really interesting stuff. Like, there are so many tidbits in here that I just, like, didn't expect to come up. That, like, if you're going to talk about architecture in, in England that suddenly you would end up delving into, like, the formulaic te tomes of, uh, you know, yeah. or Great Renaissance, etc. <laughs> uh, Inigo Jones, the architect of the Inigo first... Inigo Jones! Inigo great, Jones! Great, great Welshman, yes. Indeed, the architect Inigo of the first Jones. 
completely Renaissance building in England, the Banqueting Hall, Whitehall, yeah. London. Yeah. Sixteen. I really wish Mr. D was here right now. Sixteen twenty-two. Knows all about this. He knows all about Inigo Jones and all that kind of thing. Oh, I'm gonna check my messages again and say, please, Mr. D, please. We're talking about out. Inigo Jones. We need your help. We do. We do. Um. Yes. Uh, in sixteen twenty-two. Uh, I'm just sailed the ocean. But no, that's a different one. <laughs> no. So in ego, in, that's 1492. Sorry. Yes. In, in ego Jones in 1622 left an annotated copy uh, of Quattro Libri dell'Architettura, um, which is now in the library of Worcester College, Oxford. Jones visited Italy in 1600 and again in 1613 and 14, and thanks to Palladio's great work, the Tuscan Doric Ionic. Corinthian and composite. Corinthian, yeah. Doric. Are we still there we live? Go. Re reconnection successful. I hope that that. Okay. Didn't... I think we're still live, are we? I, I hope so. Um, I hope we did. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it looks like we're still live. There we go. Um, right. So, yes. Thanks to Palladio's great work, the Tuscan, Doric, Ionic, Corinthian, and composite orders of architecture in a Roman manner could be studied in detail with all the parts properly proportioned on the basis of the module which was half the diameter of the column, and not only the orders, but plans of buildings showing how the Italian architects had translated Roman models into brick and mortar. Palladio, in fact, ranks with Vitruvius, of whom we have already had so much to say, whose manual was written about the time of Augustus at the beginning of the Christian era. Palladio must have known Vitruvius's book, for there were many editions and translations of it in the 16th, 17th and 18th centuries. It was with the Roman version of classical architecture that Palladio was concerned. Again, this is a book aimed at children. I love that there is so much culture and history and expectation of knowledge. Um, like they are mentioning Vitruvius. <laughs> now, ob ob obviously, they've they've mentioned Vitruvius before. I'm assuming in a previous volume, but like there is just so many expectations of knowledge of like who different Romans are. Um, and what these different uh, different well, things are. Because it's expecting that you would have undertaken classics at school, isn't it? Mm -hmm. and, and that you would, you would know about the Roman world. And you would also, uh, like, it's also there to spark a bit of intrigue if you aren't aware. So yes. you, you do come in and you go, oh, I should, I should read up on this. And it gives you a I something know who to, that is. Yeah. It gives you a direction to look in. That's certainly what I found with these sorts of books um, when I was a kid, that I, I would always come across something I didn't know and go, ah, I need to look that up because I don't want to look like an idiot. <laughs> 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 which, 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 was, which was sort of like vain of me, but you know, it, 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 it was all in the right spirit. So You're so vain, Mr. Hound, so vain indeed. <laughs> you probably think this song is about you. Um, <laughs> so we come to the beginning of the 18th. If anyone gets that reference, I'm so sorry. Um, so we come to the beginning of the 18th century. In volume two, we explained how far the English architects had advanced by the time of Queen Anne. As an example of domestic architecture, we illustrated a house in the close at Salisbury, and there is no better house of the middling type in England. Uh, I really apologize for the fact that we're coming into this in volume three. Uh, mm -hmm. We should... We show that type again as figures 30 and 31 in the present book. Okay, so let me see if those are available for us to have a look at. Yes, we have these. Interesting. Stagecoaches and stuff like that. Buildings. Mm -hmm. Yes, so we have this. Let me rotate again this back to the place that it's supposed to be. We've got a load of planning drawings and, uh, and buildings here. That there, there we are. Now it's quite a palatial estate there, you can see on the on the right hand side. Goodness me. Um, okay. So this is the house. So we show this is the middling type of house on the and figures A and B at the top there. Um, in the present book. The gracefully designed doors and windows with rows of windows upon either side under the shelter of a substantial cornice combined to produce an impression of English architecture at its very best. We owe this flowering largely to the genius of Wren. Like some old alchemist, he drew his details from classical Rome, assimilated the notions of Dutch William and the practical requirements of an Englishman, and produced, 
and produced houses that were real homes, which is more than could be said of some of the later palaces. Ooh, all right. Think of Belton House, 1689, or the house at Chichester that is now the council offices, or Hampton Court itself, with its mellowed brick and stone. All yeah. are charming. At Hampton Court can be seen the ironwork of Jean Tijoux, 1690 to 1710, illustrated in a set previous volume, which led to a renaissance of that craft. The fire of London helped forward this movement. The city was rebuilt in brick, and the building trade benefited by the opportunity, and sent to it in an architectural fashion. Celia finds, uh, a certain architectural fashion, Celia finds, to whose journeys we refer to in volume two, writes of provincial houses constructed in the London manner. If anyone desires to build a house in the London manner of today, <laughs> I think it would the be uh, hung, yeah. drawn and quartered, you know. Yes. The interiors of these houses at this period were as good as the exteriors. Rooms were panelled with oak, as shown in the illustration of one of the rooms at Belton in Volume 2, a run of panels under a dado rail, and another of large panels above. The doors and fireplaces are very much part of the panelling, but enriched with carving, perhaps from Grinling Gibbon's bench. Contemporary woodwork was superb, and can be admired by Londoners at St Paul's or in the city churches. Staircases were massive achievements in wood, and during the mid-17th century, balustrades were sometimes formed of flowing scrolls of acanthus. The supporting string was straight, and the steps were housed into it, to make what was called a closed string. Sometimes the balustrade was formed of large turned balusters. Specimens still exist in Gray's Inn and the Temple. With the advent of George I and his successors, a certain pomposity crept into the planning, and people mm. began to build in a grand rather than a comfortable manner. Yeah. It, se it seems amazing now that any one man and his family can have contemplated living in such gigantic piles of stone. Lord Burlington was the great patron of the Palladian movement. He lived in Burlington House in Piccadilly, and when our readers go to the Royal Academy, they pass in under the new facade by Banks and Barry, which replaces the design by Burlington's friend, Colm Campbell. The arcaded entrance and the diploma gallery on the top were also added much later. Again, the, just the expectation of knowledge about all these places. Colin Campbell published Vitruvius Britannicus in 1715, which included an illustration of the front of Burlington House. Far more important, however, was Mealworth Castle in Kent, illustrated in the third volume, published 1725. Campbell tells us this house was roofed in 1723. The importance of Mearworth is that it was an attempt to transplant pure Palladian architecture. Palladio illustrated a villa that he had built for Monsignor Paolo Almerico, and Mearworth was copied directly from this villa and then surrounded by a moat. I shall not pretend, writes Campbell, to say that I have made any improvements in this plan from that of Palladio. Palladio was the architect's bible, and a holy writ that must not be altered. Yes. In the Palladian villa, the four porticos and the central hall made cool places where the glare of the southern sun could be avoided, but at mere worth, where only two are real porticos, the sole purpose they served was to cut off the pale northern sunshine. Fireplaces, of course, had to be added at Mearworth, and Palladian villas are not improved by chimneys, so the 24 flues were brought up in brick arches to discharge their smoke out of the top of the dome. Wow, okay. I love that. Like, sort of like architectural hijinks going on with this, you know. Make it clever. Yeah. Work smarter, not harder. <laughs> exactly, exactly, Mark. Mearworth, though amazingly interesting, marks the beginning of the end. Neither Jones nor Wren would have designed in such a fashion. They were mm. like those admirable birds who, content to swallow almost anything, pre-digest it before they beak it onto their gun. <laughs> that, is, that is a very rich metaphor, isn't it? Yeah. Very Before evocative. They it onto their young, <laughs> vomited onto their young. I, it's just something about the, like those admirable birds as well. I like, know. It's just. I love it. I love the prose of this. It's fantastic. Every se every sentence is a joy. Um, mm. 
So imagine, Lord Burlington and Campbell sit together in Burlington House, with Palladio open before them, and determining to try this Almerico villa on the hon uh, Honourable John Fane, the builder of Mirwer. He was amenable, for as Campbell says, no, never architect had a more beneficent and liberal patron. And they were not wantonly wicked, because Burlington built himself another villa at Chiswick in 1727 in much the same manner. Still, they seem to have tried it on the dog first. <laughs> Berlin... They tried it on the dock. What do you mean? So, so basically, um, they they have mere worth. Um, uh, they have mere worth, and they want to build a villa, and they can't build. They decide that they're going to try this new architectural style out. So they put it on uh, the builder of mere worth to build mere worth, and then right. they build themselves something completely different because they didn't like mere worth very much. <laughs> it's like... Wonderful. So they tried it on the dog, like they're like, Oh yeah, we've got this little side project. Let's let's try it there first, and if it doesn't work out, we'll do it <laughs> do our own one. Wonderful. Burlington was in Italy in uh, seventeen eighteen and brought back with him to Kent. Uh, brought back with him Kent, then a young painter, who after his association with Burlington was to become an architect. Uh, let me see if there's another image here that we have. Hopefully no, I mean, I've got an image here, a staircase there, but we'll we'll leave that up whilst we do this. Uh, Kent lived in Burlington House. This was one of the agreeable things about being a young architect in the 18th century. Your clients not only provided you with jobs, but through in board and lodging. Kent is thought to have helped with the interior decorations at Burlington House, and he published a book in 1727. Okay, so, so the architecture thing is really interesting as well, because it's like... You bring an architect into your home where you want the architect to do the architectural work. And then they spend their time living there. And this must have also really encouraged the architect to work things out in a practical way, an enjoyable mm. way. He'd have got to know the staff. He'd have got to know the family. He would have, like, you'd be much more... Uh, like, it's not a mentorship or a friendship or anything like that, but you're going to be much more warmly disposed, presumably. Um, and they're, it's in their interest to keep you comfortable as well, if you're the architect coming in, so that you'll design something wonderful for them. Um, and because if you're cold and callous to them, they're going <laughs> to they're yeah. gonna, they're gonna mess you around. But yeah. Well, um, you wouldn't happen to know if um, Pharaoh is available to come on for a few minutes, would you? Um, um, I will drop him a message. Um, because I'm actually due to free with him at nine o'clock. Um, but uh, but yes, because he he know all about this. The kind of the kind of um, the kind of practical sort of free thinking side of architecture, um, where kind of you know anything is possible as long as you can get it to get it to sort of stay stay up. You know. Um, Uh, let me just... I've just sent him a message. He is online, and yeah. hopefully... I know he has another stream at 9, so let's let's uh, do that. Hopefully... Hopefully he jumps in, because he, he does know a lot about this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and, of course, it'll be, it'll be nice to have the, uh, the, uh, the honourable gentleman on here as well, anyway. Hmm. Sorry, apologies. I'm just going to wait and see if he'll he'll pop on. Um, I'm going to fire him a direct message as well. <laughs> mm. Oh, he can't, unfortunately. He's got he's spending time with the wife before the stream. Oh. Ima Mrs. Ferro. Imagine that, Mrs. Ferro. Spending time with the wife in the day. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> it would not have been this way in the 18th century. Let me tell you no. that, Mister Hat. Goodness gracious! All right. Uh, okay, so uh, Kent is thought to have helped with the interior decorations at Burlington House, and he published a book in 1727. A little later, he assisted Burlington, then advising his friend Thomas Coke on the house he intended building at Holcombe in Norfolk, started in 1734. This type of plan of a central block with outlying wings connected by corridors, I think this is the uh, the enormous 
floor plan that we have here, actually. Yeah, Holcomb Hall, Norfolk, there you are. Um, this type of plan of a central block with outlying wings connected by corridors is better treated at Holcomb than in other examples, such as Kettleston, Derbyshire, designed by Adam, where the connecting corridors are much longer and curved. Thomas Coke, who became the Earl of Leicester, died leaving no children, so the estate passed to his grandnephew, the great Coke of Norfolk, of whom we have written <laughs> on page 33. I wish I had chosen as my username the great Coke of Norfolk. <laughs> that there's is still, wonderful. There's still time to rebrand, Hand. <laughs> the great Coke of Norfolk. I mean, that is quite something, isn't it? The great Coke. Mm. James Gibbs, the architect of St. Martin's Church, Charing Cross, and St. Mary Le Strand, another very gifted man, published his own book of architecture in 1728. Books of the kind, however, were becoming much too numerous, and architects designed according to Palladian rules instead of practical considerations of comfort. Inside the houses during Palladian times, the warm background of oak panelling gave way to plastered walls with mouldings planted on, and doors and fireplaces, instead of being one with the walls, often stood apart by themselves as architectural compositions complete with columns and entablatures in various okay. orders. The ornament was far more architectural and mechanical than in Gibbon's day, sometimes with an inclination to Rococo work. So I, I also know something a little bit about this, which is that the, mm -hmm. uh, the Rothschilds, one of their sons, oh. uh, built uh, a house, uh, I believe Holton House he had built, uh, which it, it became Royal Air Force Holton, RAF Holton, um, right. a building which is very sadly in disrepair nowadays. And he built it on the cheap, okay? But he still wanted all the trimmings and it to look like a luxury house um, because it was his party pad, in effect. Uh, an <laughs> enormous party pad. It has like a... The entrance hallway is three stories tall and has a chandelier the size of a small house. Um, sort of dangling down the middle of it. It's a wonderful building. Um, and he, he had like a, an entire enormous greenhouse where he could grow various psychedelic plants um, but <laughs> for his parties again and rituals and all sorts. That's, that's, um, that's marvellous. Yeah. But he, he basically did everything up. So he didn't want the wood panelling because it was far too expensive. So he basically popularised the use of Paris of plaster uh, fixtures which looked like full uh, stone fixtures, but obviously wouldn't last nearly as long. But it was enough to serve his purpose before he sold it on and gave it to the, uh, gave it to the British government to do with what they would um, later on in his life. So there you go. That's, that's part of that story. Um, in the 18th century, staircases began to have cut strings. That is, the support was cut out to the shape of the stairs and the balusters stood in groups of three on each step, and these were lighter than in the 17th century and often beautifully turned into twists and spirals. So again, we have this, this, uh, this image here uh, on the side, and you can see these gorgeous um, sort of balustrand uh, designs, and that's, that's what they're referencing there, I think, um, right. is the fact that they have this cutaway, so it's, it's, it's not solid, um, and then um, it, you have all these beautiful patterns in it. Again, something which yeah. is, is definitely missing in today's world. Well, uh, 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 cows uh, in the chat noticed that um, um, th that you can actually see, because this got revived um, in the 70s, didn't it? This, this style of staircase and this sort of uh, meshing, I suppose. Because um, there, there, there was sort of like lots of, uh, lots of revivals of that kind of thing. Mm. Mm. Um, sort of came, came back for a bit, you know. Amazing. Um, okay, so the Dilanetti, uh, sorry, Dilatanet, Dilatanti Society, uh, that was definitely not a mouthful, uh, was established in 1734 by five gentlemen who had travelled in Italy and wished to continue their studies. Italy was the source of their inspiration. The Society of Arts was founded in 1753. It was in 1741 that Horace Walpole returned from his grand tour and he for all his attraction towards architecture was to be one of the first to introduce doubt into architectural minds mm. the palladian architects had carried on the classical tradition though sometimes in a pompous way 
Walpole was to suggest that they might follow fashion instead and become Gothicists, or anything else that took their fancy. Walpole, in fact, was a goth. Now, <laughs> when we say goth... <laughs> we, we don't mean he used to go to Cyberdog in Camden Market and put black makeup on and wear knee-high socks. No, actually, he did wear knee-high socks because he was uh, living in the 1700s. Uh, that's a bad example. But uh, but they weren't made he, of leather and covered in, in small metal spikes. No, he was, he, was, he, was, he was not the goth to which we are accustomed now. He was uh, gothic. Um, he was, this was a yeah. In fact, I'm going to quote from him now. I am going to build, he wrote in 1750, a little Gothic castle at Strawberry Hill, a house at Twickenham, Middlesex, that he had bought two years before. Yep. Which but, is still there today. But Walpole was not the first goth. <laughs> no, he wasn't. <laughs> Lord Dacre had altered an enlarged Bellis Essex, a Henry VIII house in the same style in 1745, and Batty Langley brought out his Gothic architecture restored and improved in 1742. Peter Atkinson, a Yorkshire architect, added a Gothic, with a K, front and gatehouse to Bishopthorpe in York, the seat of the Archbishop of York, in 1765. Atkinson took an ordinary Georgian oblong building with a central pediment and trimmed it up with a gothic porch, battlements and arched windows. We find similar work at Arbury, Warwickshire, due to Sir Roger Newdigate and at Milton House near Didcot, 1764. There are also mm. gothic churches at Shobden, Hertfordshire and at Croom de Abiton, uh, Dabiton, Worcestershire from 1753 and 1760 respectively. Such architects attempted the impossible, and their followers ever since have been doing the same thing. The real medieval Gothic church was the sign manual of a society constituted in a way that is far more foreign to us than the civilizations of Greece and Rome. We find it difficult to understand the Middle Ages, and mock Gothic architecture is consequently an artificial affair, though this Rococo Gothic may be graceful and amusing. Again, the author is quite disparaging of the Gothic, yeah, clearly. The, 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 opinion, the opinion of the writer comes through. Indeed. I, I, do you know what? I appreciate that, though. I find it, I find it pretty good. Uh, the work at Bellus is poor, thin, and lifeless. Wow. In one of the rooms, Dacre put a classical marble chimney piece that Walpole, who went there in 1754, noted as one little miscarriage into total Ionic. In one of the drawing rooms, the walls were covered with canvas that was then painted to look like oak, and then above it, gothic arches and columns, printed on paper, were cut out and pasted onto the background. Capability Brown was called in and recommended Capability a... Brown. And recommended a ten-acre lake of form very irregular. Can we, just, can we just take a moment to admire the name Capability Brown? I know. Capability wasn't an actual name, but their name was so synonymous with Capability yes. that they became Capability Brown. Capability Brown, yeah. Which is amazing. And yet, this early Gothic revival fitted in very well, as all architecture does and must, with the spirit of the time. People were beginning to tire of the classical rules and wanted freedom and romance. The introduction mm. to the fourth chapter... Uh, oh, I appear to have skipped a page. No, no, I have not. Uh, the introduction to the fourth chapter of Henry Fielding's history of Tom Jones, not the Tom Jones that we know in not, modern not, day. Not Welsh singer Tom Jones. It's not unusual to reference the other <laughs> to Tom Jones. <laughs> Um, yes, yeah, so the introduction to the fourth chapter of Henry Fielding's History of Tom Jones, uh, 1749, is particularly interesting. We are told that the Gothic style of building could produce nothing nobler than Mr. Allworthy's house. It rivaled the beauties of the best Grecian architecture. The description of its surroundings strikes the new romantic note. There is a grove of old oaks, the lawn slope down, springs gush out of fir-covered rocks, and cascades tumble over mossy stones with lesser falls into a lake from which a river wends its way to the sea. One of these prospects is terminated by the ivy-clad towers of a ruined abbey, and then the country. The scene is laid in Somerset, rises to a ridge of wild mountains, the tops of which are above the clouds. From now on, 
there were constantly changing fashions in architecture. Instead of continuous growth and the feeling of permanence, buildings, like a woman's hat, looked foolish and old-fashioned in a year or so. <laughs> Make sure to get okay. Mrs. Hat to uh, change her hat on a regular occasion. Mrs. Hat, Mrs. hat, I'll have you know, wears only the finest and latest of the fashions of hats. And she changes them frequently. Yes, changes them frequently. Well, thank God. I, I would dread to think in a year or so if somebody described it as looking foolish and old-fashioned. That hat looks about a year old. Uh, I, I would be shocked. My monocle would fall off. So, yeah. <laughs> the Chinese fashion came into being thanks to the ideas that Sir William Chambers brought back with him from China. He published a book on designs of Chinese buildings in 1753 and another on the Chinese work he did at Kew Gardens in 1763. The architects and furniture makers managed this Chinese work a good deal better than the Gothic, and some of the interiors they produced were quaint and amusing, especially if the walls were covered with the hand-painted Chinese wallpapers that were imported about this time. Wallpapers started with patterns raised up in flock, in imitation of hangings, but they were not so much used until the middle of the 18th century. Uh, figures 40 and 41 show ch Chinese treatments. So this is the staircase with this lady uh, dressed with her Chinese fan there, as you yes, can see. Yes. Um, the staircase is beautifully made of mahogany, the bed of which is black lacquer and gold. The Goths and the Chinese, however, did not have it all their own way. Robert Adam returned from his Italian tour in 1758 to carry on the classical tradition and remained the most prominent British architect until he died in 1792, leaving behind him a peculiar impress on design. Hmm. His death okay. was followed by the declaration of war between England and France in 1793, which closed a period both architecturally and politically. I'm expecting his death wasn't the cause of the war. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> but these, these damn, damn countries getting into wars while we're trying to revolutionise architecture. You know. Yeah, it's been so, ter terrible. Most convenient. Adam does not appear to have gone to Greece. But he did go to Spalato, or Split as it's now called, in Dalmatia, and there made a study of the palace of Diocletian. The Roman work there, though it is of the greatest interest because of the peculiar freedom... Uh, let, me, sorry, let me just see if i got another picture of this Chinese manor. There you go. That's what the Chinese rooms used to look like. Yeah. Um, uh, this uh, page sentence goes over the page. The Roman work there, although it is of the greatest interest because of the peculiar freedom with which the classical details are used, is very coarse in feeling, and without any of the delicacy of Adam's work. It would seem as if Adam must have gone to Pompeii when he was in Italy, and have been influenced both by the publication of Stuart and Revett's book on the antiquities of Athens in 1762, four years after Adam had set up in practice, and by Antiquities Estercoutes, uh, Etrusks, Greeks, and Romans, published by Sir William Hamilton in Naples in 1766. Adam's work certainly had a Greek flavour. Wedgwood, who opened his works in 1769 and called them Etruria, was another thus influenced, as was Flaxman, his associate, this being the Wedgwood of, uh, of fame for Wedgwood... Um, Wedgwood, um, what's the word? Table, Tablewares, etc. Yeah, Wedgwood uh, crockery and, and, and china and such. Indeed. Thomas Leverton followed the same tradition as Robert Adam. He designed the fine Woodall Park, Hertfordshire, and some fine London houses in Bedford Square, among the best of them being number one. Smaller houses became much plainer outside, yellow bricks were used, and you can see those all over London, and the cornices and string courses were all flatter. The sash bars of the windows were made narrower as the century proceeded. Inside, the typical Adam decorations were carried out in a composition of whitening and glue stuck on the walls, and the flatness of this type of embellishment called for colouring, which was carried out in very light tints of delicate greens and blues, lilacs and dove greys, and faint yellows. Set in hmm. these... Yeah? Okay. Set, set in these painted walls were beautiful doors of mahogany, a wood that began to be used around 1720. The typical Adam fireplace were made of marble and inlaid in a very dainty fashion. Stone staircases were now constructed with elegant wrought iron pilasters, 
supporting a light mahogany handrail, and later on cast iron balustrades were employed by Robert Adam. But Adam must not be thought of as a mere decorator. He was a brilliant planner of state rooms and could fit great bows and apses and work in the twists of his compass with any of his rivals. He was no mere copyist. All the information he gathered passed through his brain and was given out with the true Adam impress. <laughs> hmm. He and his brother James published the works in architecture in 1778 to 1824 and a book on Diocletian's palace in Spilato Dalmatia in 1764. Um, again, like I appreciate we're going through a lot of kind of architectural designs and changes, um, and a lot of these people will not be familiar to the common ear. Um, but you can kind of see how, like if I'm just to summarize, like basically we went from a very, very classical uh, rules-based Romanesque uh, architectural period to um, a, like a more free thinking you know i want to say free thinking in the in the sense that the rules didn't apply as much um to like romantic gothic um kind of style of which this author is clearly disparaging and then london certainly changes from these great old um kind of uh comfortable country houses as more and more foreign influences begin to uh, to make their way into the making of these uh, these homes, and you can see the different fads which kind of an, an overtook um, in in the building sphere, and the uh, sort of then everyone got a bit overstimulated, and so typical houses became a lot more um, plain. As, as it may be seen, and, and the materials mm -hmm. themselves, and pastels were, you know, you've got this like Chinese, Chinese style thing with lacquer and gold and mahogany and, and all this stuff, and, and then it becomes pale brick and dove grey and, uh, you know, all these sort of lighter, more pastel colours, so... Uh, yes, um, would, you, would you excuse me for just five minutes? Um, so I, I can mean, just uh, sort something out over here. We, we have... Um, sort of come to we've got one two three paragraphs left if you if you don't mind sort of all right I'll, us finishing I'll, I'll hold on to them they, they are short short paragraphs so bay windows which have been out of fashion since elizabethan and jacobean times were reintroduced about the middle of the 18th century figure 35 shows a house of 1785 and it should be noted how towards the end of the century attics which earlier had been placed in the roof were now given outside walls of their own, so that the house became higher. Sir William Chambers, whose book on civil architecture was published in 1759, carried on the more masculine traditions of the Palladian school. His best known work is Somerset House in London, which is a lovely building, by the way. Henry Holland was another architect who designed with delicate grace that revealed a slight French touch. Brooks Club in London is by him, and although Carlton House vanished in 1824, it can still be examined in Pines Royal Residences. He worked at Althorpe, Northamptonshire, and designed Broadlands, Romsey, and South Hill, Bedfordshire for the Whitbreads. And there we go. And the next section will be on Newgate Prison, but uh, we are right near the end of the hour, and as Mr. Hatt does need to dash off uh, for, for a second, I think we'll bring things to a close there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for joining me on this, uh, this journey today, Mr. Hatt. No, no worries at all. It's it's always a lovely, cosy afternoon, evening uh, sort of uh, diversion, isn't it? This sort of thing, you know, lovely, lovely, uh, lovely prose, lo talking about lovely, wholesome, historical subjects. It's it's quite quite a wonderful thing to do. Elucidating the unknown as well as the known. I like it. Yes. Certainly. Bringing bringing about learning. Yes. I very much enjoy uh, these streams. I really hope that we will get to another one uh, sooner rather than later. We'll see when we can book it in. Um, and hopefully we'll be joined by Pharaoh on the next one. I'm sure he'll be very interested in the Newgate prison stuff. It's a shame that Mr. D was unable to join us for the food and drink section, but um, uh, you know, it, it's the nature of things that uh, he, he can be busy. So uh, thank you very much, Mr. Hatt. 
Uh, until next time, everyone in chat, uh, please let us know what you're thinking of this series so far in the comments below. Please like it, share it if you think that uh, people will enjoy it. And uh, until yeah. next time, take care, everybody. Good night. Absolutely. See everyone soon.